duty was the only one for the same amount of time. So then the next question is, well, how did Richard Doobie's throat get cut, right? Well, Richard Doody has complete and total control over his knife, his kitchen, and his house, and he's attacking Conrad Sipa. And Conrad Sipa goes to stop him. And they're in a struggle with the knife. That would explain it. That would explain why Conrad Sipa's DNA is not on that knife hand. Because I'm sorry. You cannot accept their argument. The science disproves it. You cannot accept the argument that Conrad Sipa is holding this knife and somehow his DNA never gets on it. That's impossible. That's impossible. And that's a reasonable doubt. That is something that should give you pause and hesitation. Reasonable doubt number three. There is no motive for Conrad Sipa to kill Richard Duke. None. Every once in a while, a prosecutor will stand up in front of a jury and say, look, I don't need to prove motive. Motive is not an element of the offense. And that's technically correct, because the prosecutor has to prove criminal intent, not motive. So there's a fine line there. But the prosecutor has to prove something that makes sense. The government's own detectives investigated the finances of Conrad Sifa and Richard Duke. Their money owed, their loan, anything like that. What did the detective say? I found zero evidence of financial motive. Did you hear any testimony about a lover's triangle? Did you hear any testimony about bad blood between those two? No. In fact, it's the exact opposite. Richard Duty was the best man at Conrad Sipa's wedding. That's Conrad Sipa. That's Richard Duty. That's the person they're saying became a cold-blooded killer and just decided to murder his best friend. Does that make sense? They can tell you who. The government can tell you where. They cannot tell you the why. And the why matters in this case, because they have to prove criminal intent. And there is no criminal intent, because Conrad Sipa was acting in self-defense. Reasonable doubt number four. Richard Duty was highly intoxicated. We know this for several reasons. What was drank? Scotch? Tequila? Tequila? What do you think, 13, 14 beers? And then there's the toxicology. Richard Duty's <coughs> blood alcohol concentration, 0.252. Let's put that in some context for a second. In the state of New Jersey, it is illegal to operate a motor vehicle or a heavy machinery if you were a 0.08 or above. So let's just double it. Let's double 0.08. We're at 0.16. Still not Richard Duty. Let's triple it. 0.24. Still not Richard Duty. And this becomes important because people react differently when they get drunk. Think your own life experience. Some people, they talk a lot. Some people get very quiet. Some people pass out. Some people get very animated. Everybody reacts differently. We have some clues on what Richard Duty is like when he drinks. So days after this happens, Virginia Murray, Richard Duty's wife, 
30 some odd years, talks to the police. And listens very carefully to what she says. He's belligerent when he drank. Now three years later, she has an explanation for what she believes belligerent means. All due respect, belligerent means belligerent. That's what it means. And that's how she's described. She doesn't like to be around him when he drank. He stopped drinking at one point. These are clues. Reprimanded her. Would not listen when he was drinking. He was a complainer. Then it would be gone. That's what she said. He was a complainer. Then it would be gone. What's that a polite way of describing? The scope bottle found in Richard Duty's pocket. Maybe it means nothing to him. Maybe it means something <coughs> than all the other pieces of the puzzle. The refrigerator. Wine. Beer. Mike's hard lemonade. Let me ask you this. What's more likely? <coughs> that of all the nights that Conrad Sipa, 50 some odd year old occupational therapist, just decides to become cold blooded killer on the exact same night that Richard Duty is a .252. Think that's what happened? Or is there another explanation? Does it fit? Richard Duty is highly intoxicated, became aggressive, and became violent. Reasonable doubt number five. You're being asked to piece together what happened in that house. And you're left with physical evidence to make a decision. And I want you to pay very close attention to the physical evidence. Richard Duty, each piece gives you a little clip. Richard Duty has no injury to the rear of his head or body. What does that mean? This was face to face. This was a fight to the death. He wasn't sucker punched. He wasn't hit from behind. This was a fight. There's bruising on Richard Duty's knuckles. Dr. Hood says, yeah, they're bruises, minor bruises. They did not magically appear. He has bruising to his knuckles. We can't escape that fact. What does that mean that he has bruising to his knuckles? Does that mean that Richard Duty was defenseless, just sitting there, and that's what happened? Let's go a little more. I asked a couple of times about the bruising on Richard Duty's arm. This is really important. So what does Virginia Murray say when she testifies? She says, I met Richard Duty because we played softball together 30 some odd years ago. She says, I'm lefty, he's lefty, he's thrown with his left hand. So how does that bruise end up on his arm? Right here. Well, if he's lefty, he's got a knife in his hand, and he's coming after Conrad Sipa, right there. Conrad Sipa caused that bruise. That's how that bruise got there. Tell me another way that gets there. Conrad Sipa stopping Richard Duty from stabbing him. That's why that bruise is there. There's no other explanation for it. 
What else does the physical evidence tell us? You heard John Borkowski talk about these pump tape, describes them as pump tape wounds. And you remember he took the knife, he overlaid it with the photograph. There's something troubling about these wounds. Because they're on the neck. And it doesn't make a lot of sense that there are these superficial wounds to the neck. Because if Conrad Sipa has full access, then those wounds are not superficial. I'm sorry, they're not, right? So why are those superficial wounds there? Well, I would suggest that if you're struggling over a knife and you're face to face and it's going back and forth, that would explain it. That would explain it. Why else are they superficial? Conrad Sipa has a laceration to his left hand. He has bruising. And where did they fight? This is important. Where does this happen? There's the chair. Where is it? That is the only exit. Right there. Somebody's trying to run out of the house. Who's trying to run out of the house? Is it Richard Duty? No. It's Conrad C. There are no photographs. You heard no testimony that a doctor, nurse, anybody else examined the back of Conrad Sifa's head. Can you tell me right here as we sit that Conrad Sifa was not struck in the back of the head as he ran out that door? Physical evidence does not support her. Physical evidence only supports self. I'm going to talk about the investigation. And I want to say this up front so that there's no misunderstanding. I am not, absolutely not standing here saying that any of those officers or detectives got up on the stand and intentionally lied to you or they are bad detectives, bad cops. I'm not saying they're bad people. But we have to look at their investigation. <coughs> the easy pass records. They never checked them. And Detective Mark Baker, again, I am not standing here telling you he lied. But last week, he sat on that witness stand, and he was asked about easy pass records. And he said three things. I got easy pass records. There was no activity on the easy pass records. And if I had them, I would have given them to the prosecutor. Those are three things that are not true. And I will give credit to Detective Murphy because he got up on the witness stand yesterday and owned it. Now he says he misspoke. The cell phone. Would you like to know what's on that cell phone? Would you like to know the GPS coordinates? Would you like to know if there were text messages exchanged? Would you like to know if there were phone calls that were placed? Would you like to know that? The state has the burden. If there are questions, don't look at us. Look at the government. The golf club. The state's presented you with an indictment, and they have named this golf club as a murder weapon. This, more than anything else, speaks to the desperation of their case trying to come with some explanation as to what happened. This is the evidence law. Adam's golf club, broken in half. FP processing, fingerprint processing, right? That's the second half of the golf club. Fingerprint processing. No DNA, no blood. 
I'll do you one better. It's not even swapped. How do we know this? There are six other golf clubs that they retain. What do they do to all six of those? They swap them. Preserve for future DNA analysis. Oh, so the only golf club that the state didn't swap for DNA is the one they're telling you is the murder one. And you would have to get past the fact that despite John Garkowski's testimony, what did Dr. Hood say? The nose was palpably intact. So you have to get past the fact that they're claiming the golf ball was used here, but somehow his nose is not broken. And they didn't test it. So why, why, why is that in the indictment? Why are they telling you this is a murder one? And the answer is simple. Because they don't know. They don't know. Mr. Sheehan and Ms. O'Neill are outstanding prosecutors, but they were not there. They do not have superior knowledge. And this golf club, this is just throwing things against the wall and seeing what stuff. What didn't they do? They did not thoroughly investigate. They limited their searches. They only subpoena Wawa for a half an hour. They do not review the Harvey Sears police surveillance footage. They don't test. And I'm sorry, I can't remember who it was that said, we didn't send these things because the state police just doesn't test things sometimes when we send it out. Give me a break. Give me a break. This is a murder case. This has consequences. The stakes are too high. But we didn't send it because we didn't know if they'd test it. Reasonable doubt number seven. The things they got wrong. They incorrectly identified Conrad Sifa's vehicle on five separate occasions. One, the Ron John search on November 21st at 2.43. They said, that's Conrad Sifa's car, right there. <coughs> oh, wait a minute. Doesn't have a silver rear view mirror. What did Detective Murphy say? not his car? Apparently not. Also, while they're saying that that's Conrad Sifa's car, let's forget about what the car looks like for a second. They're saying at 243 at the Ron John Surf Shop, that's Conrad Sifa's car. In evidence, they have a receipt from Byron. Conrad Sifa buying alcohol at 2.44. Could he have made it? It's four and a half miles. So they're telling you that's Conrad Sifa's car, and they just got it wrong. That's what happened. Incorrect ID number two, Wawa, 2.43. They don't preserve the video. Incorrect ID number three, 86th Street, November 22nd at 6.41 a.m. That's Conrad Sifa's car. Oh, wait a minute. There's no roof rack. Apparently not. Reasonable doubt number seven. Four things they got wrong. Bergen Avenue, November 22nd, 6.43 a.m. That's Conrad Sifa's car. Oh, wait a minute. There's no roof rack. That's not Conrad Sifa's Five, Wawa, 1119. No, no red rear view mirrors. Excuse me, red rear view mirrors, not silk, not Conrad Sifa. Why am I talking about this? Because Mr. O'Neill may get up here and say, well, what difference does it make, right? So they got the cars wrong. 
They're coming to you, trying to prove to you beyond a reasonable doubt what happened inside that house. And they're not getting it right what happened outside the house when they have cameras and ALPR, the tag rules. That's why it matters. No activity on the easy pass records, except there is. Garden River Toll Plaza, 2204 Central Ave. 35 miles. Missed it. Just missed it. The golf club. John Garkowski says, well, the injuries were likely caused by the wind. And then, I don't, I don't want to make fun of it, but he gets down on all fours and redirect and he says, well, if he was lying down, and maybe if his head was on the ground, and maybe if he teed it up that way. At this point, John Barkowski is just making it up as it goes along. Reasonable doubt number eight, Dan Johnson. I know we had to go through a lot of loads yesterday, and I know that was tedious. I want you to compare Jan Johnson with John Barkowski. Yes, she went through everything. There's another word for that. Thorough. She's routinely used by the government as an expert witness. She gives a very candid answer. She says, yes, crime scene reconstruction has a subjective element. She doesn't guess. She doesn't speculate. She says, we don't know this. And how many things did Jan Johnson tell you that you never saw before? The blood in the kitchen. We never tested it. All these things. There's two golf clubs there. Don't have clubs on. Did you hear that before she testified? What she gives you is a sequence of events. There's evidence of a struggle. A lamp was used, and then a knife. And that becomes important. And there's no way to determine who had possession or control. She's a credible witness. And she's candid. There's evidence of a cleanup. She's not hiding. Warts and all. Reasonable doubt number nine. What didn't the state tell you as they're presenting evidence? Keep track of the things that were introduced by the state and the things that were introduced by Mr. Seaver. The blood was found in Conrad's car. That's Conrad Seaver's Ms. Nzezon testified. You didn't hear that from the government. You heard that from us. Why? Picture of Scope in Richard Dewey's left pocket. The alcohol stock fridge in the basement. Jeannie Murray describing Richard Dewey as belligerent. He didn't like to be around. She wasn't asked that. We had to bring that. No fingerprints on the golf club. And this is my favorite answer. Ms. O'Neill stood up when Detective Capuano testified. She said, Detective Capuano, what does it mean to you that there's no fingerprints on the phone? <coughs> what did Detective Capuano say? Doesn't mean anything to me. 